Hello, I'm Emilio Velis from Apropedia Foundation, and I want to um, give you a warm welcome to the second class of the Critical Making Mentorship Program, in which we will talk about how to share, how we make things. Uh, and yeah, to begin, I would like to give you an overview of the things that we'll be discussing. First, talking a little bit about making and documenting. You know, just a, a small motivation overview of why do we want to share how we make things. Then secondly, some documentation principles, some guidelines, good practices. Um, this is very uh, non-extensive in the way that I'm not going to talk about the specifics of how do you document and what are the standards for documenting because there's lots of information out there about that but rather i would like to talk about good principles for critical making you already have been um, discussing a lot about why you make things making things that make sense so i want to go in this line and think about how the documentation can help you uh, connect to the communities that you want to impact and and how you can create a more dialogical process it, through documentation, right? So when we talk about documentation, we're thinking about one-sided communication from a person who's developing, creating things to a group of people who are receiving, right? So how do we create um, feedback? How do we engage and build a community? So those are the things I want to bring in. Um, in this class and then talk a little bit about the specific best practices, um, some ideas that you might find interesting. Then finally, how to enable the impact. Um, taking what we are making and then just going beyond, right? Uh, we are usually making something because it's part of a project, it might be a class project, it might be a startup, it might be part of a research uh, project. But then you want to go beyond and maybe what you made will create impact years down the road in different um, areas, uh, geographical areas, different groups of people that you might have not thought about before. Um, first, an introduction about making and documenting uh, and a little bit about myself. I have been working in international development and open hardware and the open movement in general. So I've been back and forth. I've done lots of projects that involve designing things. Uh, for example, this is a project that was called Reacción here in El Salvador. And we designed a mesh network uh, that people would connect to using devices, sending signals um, of distress, depending on the gravity of a disaster, such as a earthquake or maybe a hurricane and then to organize communities around that. So we did lots of work with uh, users that were not the common open hardware users, right? Uh, but we also had to connect with technical communities. We also had to work with people uh, who were part of disaster risk uh, reduction and uh, you know, different types of people with different interests and communication was really important. And within communication, documentation played a vital role in how we shared, not only how to build something, but also how to use it, how to apply it, use cases, etc. cetera. Um, and then nowadays I am executive director of the Apropedia Foundation and we run a wiki for sustainability and international development. Uh, we have thousands of solutions and there are different things that you can find in there. For example, uh, devices that can be 3D printed, but you can also find earthen benches and things that are not necessarily measured, but there is practice um, and there's action that you have to take into account materials. Um, there's community organizing different things that are difficult to communicate, right? So all of these things together make up uh, the wealth of information on Apropedia. And we try to 
teach people how to best document, how to share all of this knowledge in a way that makes sense for many different people, that many different groups that might benefit from it. Um, so yeah, why do you want to document something? Why would you do it? So I would begin by saying, how do we explain? How do we even come to tell someone this is what we made. This is how we made it. Uh, it's so difficult. Um, the first thing that comes to mind, this comes from uh, an example by Richard, uh, Richard Stallman, which is cooking recipes, right? So this is the analogy of documentation from the cooking recipe. You're cooking something because you're hungry or maybe because you want to eat something that's delicious. And... There's different motivations and there are different uh, different ways of explaining someone how to cook something. You might uh, give a recipe over the phone with some instructions, some troubleshooting, some things you have to be aware of. Uh, or you might fixate that knowledge onto a book or a, a web page and someone can read many years um, in the future about it and then reproduce whatever um, you have made before. And I don't know if it has happened to you, but sometimes it's very difficult if you've never eaten something and you cook it to know whether the thing that you made is the real thing, right? Uh, you need to have some nuances to explain how it should look, how it should taste. Uh, which makes the documentation extensive, but also descriptive, and it gives people a sense of uh, knowing what they're about to do and what they've done and whether it's good or not, right? So it's very difficult. And it becomes somewhat complicated when you're making physical devices because there are so many things to take into account. There's um, technical elements that you might uh, know about, but there are some others that might be new to you, especially if you're building uh, to reproduce a solution that's needed at the time and it's not because it's your specialty. You need to solve a problem for yourself, for others, and you're reproducing a device. Um, so information about whether it's well done or not. Uh, in this case, this is an ox oxygen concentrator, which is a, a, a device that helps um, um, collect oxygen from the air in order to reuse probably for um, uh, medical applications. And that was, um, this is one of the cases in the COVID-19 pandemic. So there's a very critical use for it and you need to know whether you're doing it well, right? And you need to know other things like, would it be too expensive to build? What are the, the pros and cons in building it yourself compared to um, bringing it, um, you know, from someone else, uh, or buying it, etc. So there are so many things that you have to take into account, and documentation helps create that bridge between the person who came up with an idea of a product of a device and the person who is trying to fulfill a need for themselves or others. And there's a lot of uh, soft uh, information that's usually not uh, the kind of thing that an engineering thing, team would think of, but rather it might be related to marketing, it might be related to solving social issues about sustainability and other aspects that are really important, especially when we are uh, engaging in critical making. So we have to think of that. And there's also the aspect of working with a team of people, and that's important. You are sometimes organizing groups of volunteers or engineering teams, uh, people with specific skills that might go beyond your scope of expertise, and you have to coordinate. And documentation plays a vital role in this communication. There are two main approaches to documentation, according to literature. One is a series of statements that reflect facts about the world, right? So you're trying to fixate the world into diagrams or uh, mathematical formulas, or uh, it could be digital uh, files. 
And then there's another aspect of documentation as experiences and narratives. Things like what motivates you to make something? Why did you make it? And is is this something that will be useful to me, right? So um, the process of defining documentation is very broad uh, and it goes through a series of decision-making uh, experiences from the past, whether there's um, a positive feedback, yes, I made this, I used it, it solved the problem, right? So there are so many things uh, that are not necessarily facts. So it's not this, it's not the world, this is what I made and I'm turning it into bits and atoms necessarily, but also there's a lot about the stories behind it, um, especially when you're dealing with people who want to solve real problems. You have to um, create empathy with the needs and the expectations. So, yeah, so both facts and narratives are important because facts help deliver real technical impact. You solving, you're advertising in a way for something and you say, yes, this is going to be done. And then there are narratives and we explain the why and then it helps um, solve important issues. So both have to go hand by hand, and this is the first thing that I would like to leave with you. And then let's talk a little bit about open source documentation. Um, there's value in thinking about open source and open documentation, not only as a set of licenses, right? Because first of all, openness is related to the freedoms of open knowledge. There are freedoms that we allow. For example, the freedom to uh, make, reproduce, copy, remix. And then you're transferring knowledge and experiences of making. You're letting other people go into your mind, your thought processes. And then it helps other people acquire some skills that are needed to solve specific problems, right? So there's a transformation that goes beyond simply sending bits of information that people read and then they just reproduce, right? There's process of thinking about what they're making, about uh, realizing whether this is going to solve a critical problem and then giving feedback about, yes, this is what I needed and this is super useful, right? So. Um, this is what we have to think about when we think about all the aspects of open source and what we are allowing when we are using open licenses. So it's important to think of openness as more than just using licenses. It's a philosophy of knowledge production, collaboration, right? So those two things, knowledge production, how do we create this knowledge for others? And then how would we collaborate, even if it's separated by space and time? there's a process of dialogue, um, which is done through the documentation in many cases. Um, and this uh, brings, for, for example, uh, to me, uh, the experience of the first open hardware event that we organized in El Salvador in 2013. And uh, this guy came uh, with a, a rep wrap and it was the first one that I had ever seen in person. And he started explaining that um, he had received some physical um, pieces from someone in Spain who sent them to him. Uh, and he started printing and playing with it, etc. But then it was about to uh, get, um, you know, the, the, the printer was not going well. It was uh, breaking in some parts. So he was able to print the last um, piece to repair it in the printer and then it broke, but he was able to switch the piece, right? So um, he was explaining all of this and it happened not only because of the pieces that were sent to him, but also because of the instruction and the communication with a team of people that were able to help him uh, solve all of his issues as a person who had never used the 3D printer before. And I thought that was fascinating, right? How you can give people instructions, help them develop the skills to make, to maintain, to fix. 
And we've applied a lot of that uh, in our work with Reaction. For example, this is a workshop that we did in Boston uh, in 2017 to help people make um, the PCB boards by hand, right? So this is something that um, not people will not enjoy it much, but it's necessary if you want to build electronics in uh, low resource settings. You have to have an oven and you might want to do some things by hand and you can attain some very good quality uh, for the things if people learn um, the skills, right? So this was how we made some of the devices that we were using and it was uh, a very good experience to see other people apply these skills. And with this, openness helps us bridge between different groups that are usually separated due to power imbalances uh, that have to do with, it can be, you know, location, wealth, etc., cetera, um, educational level. So for example, there are differences between experts and non-experts, right? So uh, sometimes we create documentation that is connected to people who know about electronics, about programming, but there are also non-experts who are important to involve in the process of creating and of sharing how we make things so that the product makes sense. Hard and soft skills, uh, engineers, but you also have designers and how do you make them work and how do you, do you give both of them information that's useful to them? And then people with only local experience with people who have global experience, right? So there are all these um, differences. And the goal of open documentation is to bridge how they work, how they collaborate. And this is a process of humanization, right? Because you're valuing um, both the knowledge and the experiences. And when you put both of them together, you're able to solve specific problems in a way that makes sense, not only to you, but for the people who are reproducing by using the documentation. Then another principle is to share for users. Thinking of a person. Uh, in my experience, I work with, for example, um, as I mentioned before, people who are going out to the field and uh, taking data by hand. So instead of saying, we need technology to solve this, we go out with them, we learn about how they do their work, and then we make things that they might use or that they might contribute to, right? So how do we engage users that are not interested in the technical aspects of making things, but whose information is important? Then um, this is a series of photos that happened on the same day. We had um, teams from four different fab labs who were designing cases for our device reaction in Mexico, in El Salvador, in Uruguay, um, and they were all you know, collaborating. We were creating these spaces where people would, for example, talk, discuss, and then do a sprint of design. And the documentation took a big role with photos, with uh, taking um, photos of the drawings and having uh, collaboration and discussion and then putting all of this together so that it could be used later on, right? So um, the process of dialogue is what brings uh, documentation to the front. And documentation has to live in the process so that collaboration can make sense. And we've also worked with people using technology that maybe don't know how to read and write or have a low scholarity level, educational level. So um, by applying documentation, by learning, using different formats, by showing them information in a way that makes sense for them, um, we were able to gather really important information or to have insights that would impact the way that we were designing, the way that we were implementing solutions. So it is important to go all the way down uh, the chain of the process of making from people who have the idea, people who are making, people who are implementing, 
and the people who are using, right? Uh, the devices, the solutions. For example, this is um, a project on which we went out uh, to a rural community, talked to the children, talked to older people, and discussed with them what our plans were, getting feedback, trying to um, use the documentation as a layer where we were sending information to them and then they were giving us feedback and then we were reusing it, etc. So that's a way of building a community, having people informed, knowing that we care for the needs, for their insights, their experiences, and then um, also to bring in factual information, technical aspects. So yeah, some of the users that you might find when you're creating um, documentation products are as experts in the area of application. So for example, you're creating an open source medical device. So you have to talk to doctors and maybe the, the, the end users will be people who are sick, for example, or people who have um, a problem that so the device will be applied on them. Uh, but the experts might give you information and they, they will be the ones applying them, implementing. So you might want to develop lists of use cases so that um, people who are applying know this is what you can use this device for, create real expectations about what you can and cannot do, about the precision of what, uh, what you're creating. This is able to measure this, but not measure this. And then other different features uh, so that people really know the uh, reach, the scope, the limitations. Then there, there's a technical team. Um, I know that there's some people who know everything from creating a solution um, and fabricating it and then implementing it. But in some cases, you might find that there are people who commission the building of an open source device to someone else. Right? You, they might go to a shop and ask a carpenter or uh, a welder to say, hey, can you build this for me? And there's someone who does it. That happens as well on Fab Labs. Um, with Fab Labs, people go into a space and say, hey, I want to build this. Here are the, you know, here's the documentation. And someone builds it for them. Right? So um, you have to create a documentation that goes specifically for the people with technical skills, uh, with things such as the bill of materials, tool lists, assembly instructions, and then how to calibrate. Because maybe they're not experts in, for example, medical devices, or they're not experts in um, precision making. So you have to tell them, calibrate it this way, uh, make sure that it's measuring or it's applying force, it's... Uh, closing and opening the way that it should, etc. right? So how do you validate that something has been well done? That is a different product of documentation. And then finally, the end users and probably maintainers, right? So the device will be given to someone, they will use it, they will know um, and, and test whether it's been um, useful for them. And then probably they will put it away for a while and then reuse it or someone else will use it. Uh, so it's important to think about how do you do minor calibration to know whether it's working well uh, and then troubleshooting, oh, this isn't working. It's not, you know, it's not um, turning on. So check batteries. Um, this is how you use it. Or uh, you might want to bring it back to an expert after this happens or etc. right? Um, so all of these users might need different knowledge products. Might be the same information in some cases. In some cases not, it's separate information, but the language that you're using, uh, the technical details might be uh, more in their face for some types of users than others, right? So. The format, how you present that information is important when you think of sharing how you make things. And then think about reproduci reproducibility. Share to reproduce. When we think about reproduction, uh, we're usually thinking of making a hundred, a thousand of the same object. 
But this is not always the case, right? Sometimes there are different ways of thinking of reproducibility. For example, the RepRap project is a good example of taking one idea where what you're trying to reproduce is the end goal, which is I want to be able to reproduce a physical device using a specific type of material. Um, and then people are creating iterations of the same idea by using different technical specification. And then you have a family of solutions. So the main idea or the main goal that you want to attain is what's really driving the creation and making, right? So in this case, the information that you're trying to communicate is more about what you want in the end and not necessarily about the bits and pieces of the device. It is useful so people can study it and then create something, but it's not the specific thing that you uh, need to give them, right? Uh, and people might decide whether to take um, something and reproduce it or take inspiration from it. So you want to enable, other than the technical facts, um, that people gain an understanding of what is the problem to be solved. There might be things um, that you learned as an insight. You found out there's a problem that can be solved using hardware and you want to help them in, go in and learn about that problem, then understanding the rationale behind the solution. What steps did you take and where did you take that inspiration to build something? And then learning how to make a solution, you know, learning, gaining the skills and then reproducing. So thinking about knowledge and experiences. What new things can people learn by looking at what you made and how you made something, right? So there's a personal value in that, that you're enabling through documentation. Then how can others learn how to do the same as we did? What are the skills that have to be taken into account or what other people have to be brought in uh, to share those skills? And then freedoms, what freedoms are we enabling? What are the things that people were not able to do before, but then after um, implementing a solution, they're able to do it, right? So all those, all those things go beyond the technical aspects and they are enabling critical making. So you bring in the experiences, the technical aspects, you put them together and people will be able to reproduce a solution. To broaden the degree of reproducibility, you may consider, uh, as I mentioned before, sharing your uh, problem solving process. What, what were you thinking about? What decisions led you to create what you created? Encourage others to develop the skills, create then technical documentation so that people can see it, follow the steps, and then consider some alternatives to making and using. Uh, and with this, you might want to think about people who do not have the same materials as you do or do not have access to the same machines. So you want to give them the ability to think of alternatives. Maybe it's not something that you can think of because you're not in their space, but you're giving them the tools so they can start thinking uh, and you're enabling still the solving of a problem. And then share with a goal in mind. With this, I, I was thinking about how sometimes I've been on you know, a website just looking for something to print just because I can print it. And I'm just, you know, doom scrolling, um, trying to find something. So yeah, um, maybe we should try motiva motivating users through our documentation, communicating what is the problem to be solved. Um, maybe by helping other people research about technologies and thinking about what information is useful. Maybe it can be specifications, it can be about uh, the skills that are needed, the type of uh, materials, etc. Then um, 
maybe some people are trying simply to learn a skill and what you have created is serving an educational goal right so you want other people to learn how to do something and that is what the documentation is meant for it and that is okay a lot of the work of critical making for example can be super useful in education by teaching children how to do little things or maybe adults who are going to a fab lab um, so yeah don't feel like you have to solve super uh, concrete and big goals but you may want to help others simply uh, become good at certain something and then you're uh, building up from there and then finally maybe you want to contribute to a solution that already exists right uh, and that is why you're going and looking at the documentation enabling through it that people can become part of the community is a good practice that will help um, other people become engaged. So there are goals in mind and you have to think about how you address different motivations or different expectations from the people who will come to your documentation page. So that instead of doom scrolling, they look at something and they say, yes, this is something that I would like to solve. Or yes, this is the kind of question that I was trying to answer. Or this is what I want to learn and it, this looks really accessible to me. Uh, or I want it to be part of an open source uh, project and this is the kind of project that I want to work in, right? Um, so you have to make things that make sense if you want to engage with people. And we've seen this um, when we were trying to build um, all these technological solutions for people who had been uh, victims of natural disasters or who were suffering from um, some hazards in their communities. So they're able to, you know, they're interested, they're engaging, and you have to make sure that you're uh, fulfilling the expectation. If making sense, for example, is saying through the use of technology, you're learning a little bit about how you communicate, about how you can engage in community organizing, it's good enough. If you're saying we can save lives through using technology, well, you have a big claim and you have to help validate it, right? So this is something that we came across. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a big difference between having a super validated sensor that's expensive, like the one here on the left, and then the one on the right, which is a, a project that was done in an afternoon, probably, and you can make at home, but it might not be, might be enough to understand something. It might be useful for a short period of time or in emergencies, but maybe um, there are some limitations and it's okay to have them. You know, um, that is the beauty of open hardware solutions that you can scale based on um, maybe cheaper things that are easy to reproduce with open documentation. And the goal is to build things that can deliver the same as a proprietary product. So share with the goals in mind, Share what are your motivations, the project status, the limitations, tell people where you're at, what you've found, what can others do, um, and then invite others to improve your solution. That is important, and that is one motivator. If people see that what you're making is good, and maybe there are some things that you're still to solve, that is a way of inviting others to be part of the project, to... Uh, come in, work on the solution, develop it. And then reduce the gaps. This is an example of how um, we were trying to solve this problem of engaging with grandmothers and kids who uh, were working in this community and they were interested in, you know, sensors for natural disasters, right? We wanted to help develop a model of community organizing and we were using technology as a gateway for that uh, we had children who had been taught about technology they knew how to use it um, they were interested 
and you know just building things with Arduinos. We had grandmothers who knew about natural disasters. We did some training with them over some months. Then we wanted them to work together, right? So using these cards that each of them had a sensor and the description of what the sensor did helped them understand what they wanted to measure, how they wanted to measure it. So what they're doing there is using a canvas on which they're uh, discussing which sensor and what feature can this device that they're um, uh, designing may have, right? So it, it is an accessible way of using technology that they can look at, they can read about, we can show them the physical uh, sensors, and then they can feel like they are contributing. And this was a good way to having them discuss back and forth. So yeah, the, 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 the reason why I bring this up is that we're not only trying to sh uh, solve a problem, but we're also addressing individuals. They all have their desires, they have their motivations, um, and they want to be motivated in order to be part of a project, right? So in the documentation, try to think about what, what do people want to achieve? Are they, uh, are they, for example, coming to review the documentation for a, an environmental um, monitor kit because they want to learn? Uh, how they work, or maybe because they want to solve a problem, a real problem in their community. Are you using the correct language? Um, are you giving them translations? Are you using the right vocabulary for their degree of expertise? Uh, are you addressing their educational level in a way that it's accessible for them to understand the main goal and maybe ask for help? Uh, to other people with more expertise, enabling collaboration. Uh, maybe are you telling them what kinds of skills they need in order to solve a problem using your solution? What, what is their access to technology? And how are you addressing that? What is their environment? Do they have access to a lab? Maybe they're doing it at home. Um, and what are the resources that they might um, come across? Are they able to order things online? Maybe go to a shop? and buy things or maybe ask someone else to do it for them, right? So all those things uh, make it important that you create documentation, but then think about adapting when you're finding new users um, and then taking a new format with uh, languages, maybe translation, different types of examples, different technical details at hand so that people can look at them, right? So this is a process of communication. In critical making, you have to think about the people that you're serving who want to solve a problem and then adapt. Always iterate. And this is a good way of addressing the right problem, giving them the right information, and then enabling them to create impact. Um, then share as you make the things. Don't wait until the end um, of a project in order to build something, but rather go and start now. You're at the lab, you're at your space working, start doing drawings, take photos of everything, uh, don't delete the documents, take photos of your colleagues who are working, take screenshots of your, um, you know, of your calls, etc., of the things that you've made, maybe some prototypes that are super ugly, just take photos of them, put them in a folder, organize them. Um, you'll use them at the end and think about the narrative. What is the narrative that is building as you're creating something, uh, which will be super useful, uh, especially when you're collaborating with all these people. What do they think? What is their thought process? Um, so this is a, a photo of the workshop that I showed you before with four different uh Fab Labs were working together. And we took all of the drawings. We have photos of every single one, but we also asked them, why did you make it this way? Um, and some people were like, well, you know, I think it's gonna be able, uh, a person is going to be able to grip it this way, or maybe when there's a natural disaster, there's water everywhere. So you need to make it waterproof. Maybe it can float, maybe it can, you know, uh, maybe a strap for a person. And thinking about the rationale behind it helped us come up with the final product 
or a proposal, etc. But um, having an insight of how people think as they're doing it is helping us. Um, what are the questions that people come across when they look at documentation? And this is coming uh, very close to the concept of the digital garden, which is a process that I really enjoyed. Uh, there's a really nice article by Maggie Appleton, uh, who speaks about how the digital garden is basically a mindset in which you're taking documentation, not from start to finish, but rather you're just taking all of this information and nurturing, uh, organizing by different uh, main ideas and then just letting information grow. And then you take this and create a knowledge product that you may share with other people. So think about your planning. What were you thinking at the beginning? What are the observations? What worked? What didn't work? What activities you had to do? How much time it took you to uh, develop something, to reproduce it? What are the technical requirements? And then the results. What did work? What didn't work? How people failed? And that'll help you um, enabling better reproducibility. Right? So this might come as, for example, microblogging. Some people use Twitter to share, hey, today I was doing this and it worked or it didn't work. And these are the reasons. Maybe you have some private notes, you're reaching Notion. Um, a lot of people use Acropedia to do their work. And they do, for example, literature reviews. They have a literature review page and they start simply uh say, hey, I visited this website, I saw this, and it works because A, B, or C, or maybe it doesn't for this reason. Um, yeah, they just go through it, and then later on, they use this to create the documentation. Um, yeah, so you can use external information, your personal stuff, the uh, work that you've done with other people, and then you're creating a curated set of information that you are putting up front so that other people can learn. So it doesn't take more than the work that you're already doing. So you don't have to recreate. You might be curating all of this content. This, this is a really cool example that I can show you. Uh, it's a video of uh, uh, a maker in Madrid who's creating a literature review during the COVID pandemic about DIY masks. And I really love this because uh, what Cesar was doing is uh, putting up, uh, you know, a stream and starting to read, taking notes. This is a cool way of documenting and sharing how you do things. You can create a stream uh, on Twitch or on YouTube and start talking about, hey, this I'm doing this. You know, I'm trying to solve this problem. And people can see what you're doing and you can come back and look at it and say, oh, so this is what I did, right? So there's this phrase that documentation is a love story from your past self, right? So it's it's a way of saying, you're gonna need this and you're creating all this content. You you don't need to curate it right away. You're just using all of this information, putting it in, uh, in a platform that's for your own use, but then you'll use it later on. Then use the right formats. Think about how people will be able to um, use whatever you made um, and about the freedoms that you want to enable, right? So there are individuals and there are machines and you should be able to enable freedom for both. They both can read documentation and you have to think about, for example, this presentation is made using um, a notepad and it has human readable uh, aspect to it. So you can see what does this specific slide entail. And I, I, I can read it as I create it. And I don't have a need to use a machine, which is the browser to parse it, right? So this is a good way of having something that both a machine and a person can read. And there are formats for documentation that are really good for that. Um, that can enable reproducibility as well. You see, using, for example, Jupyter notebooks. Um, but you know, you can do uh, do it the way that you feel more comfortable. 
For speaking to humans, think of text-based formats that are easy to open, um, leave always comments on your code, on your technical materials. For example, if you made a drawing by hand, take a photo of it, but put comments on it so that people know what it is. You can remember what it is, why you did it. Um, add as many audiovisual materials as possible images, videos, and audio. You can record yourself about, you know, your tasks, about creating things, uh, and then you can revisit it. Other people can look at it if they're interested. And use those accessible platforms to host the materials. And this is important because uh, when you're using complicated platforms that require a login, that are only in English, that's a big problem for some groups of people. So you have to be mindful of that. And then speaking to machines, use good file formats that are easy to parse, edit, convert, um, avoid proprietary formats or um, formats that are open in paid software. And in some cases, proprietary formats are easier. So you can have versions that are open source so that people still have access, right? Um, Make sure to um, be redundant when necessary. Add as much metadata as possible because machines are good at reading metadata. Uh, and then other people can aggregate vices. One example is the open know-how standard that can help you add metadata about the, the thing that you're making. And then other people can crawl this, they can explore it. And it can also be human readable so people can read about it. Uh, about the keywords, about the um, uh, licenses, etc. Use version control. Version control is so useful because you can see over time how something was created and try not to encrypt files so that machines can open it really quickly. And then share the complete process. Um, you know, think about who is going to use the documentation it might be experts who wants to see how you made something go back in time make changes but sometimes you can you you might want to create fixed material that people can read easily uh, on a web page and you know the, the important thing is thinking about who your audience is and how will they use the documentation and then create or adapt the documentation to reflect the needs of those users. Um, let uh, the documentation follow a user flow, which is think about how will the people engage with each of the different steps in the process of creating something. And this image here comes from one of my favorite pieces of documentation of all time, which is the open source rover from NASA. It's so cool. Um, I think if you wanna have, a, um, you know, be inspired by good documentation, go check this out. They really think about the user flow, how people will engage with the documentation. It's all on GitHub and I think it's brilliant. Um, and keep copies of editable files so that people can come back to them, make changes. So try to enable people playing with the documentation as much as possible. Um, and yeah, if you have publishing files, and with this I mean, for example, editable text, you wanna have a PDF because it's easier. Good, but also have a copy of the uh, text-based document so that others can just play with it. Uh, and manage collaborations, as I mentioned before, using the version control feature. Um, ha have good track, uh, leave comments on why you made the changes, so that other people can look at them and the best that you document and have good control over the flow of the development, the more people will want to be part of your community. Uh, create the redundant formats, as I mentioned before. This is really cool. Uh, it's an um, open source simulator for applying a tourniquet on a patient. And they have a user manual that was created using Notion. They have images describing the process of making, but there's also a video showing the step-by-step -step process of making. So uh, if you can make many 
different versions of the documentation, it will be super good. Sometimes people learn by watching the video, then go read the documentation, and they say, oh, now I get it, right? So, or maybe um, backwards, they like reading technical aspects and then they go and use the video so that they can um, do, uh, do as they see, right? So think about all those different ways in which you can create formats for documentation. And then think about open licenses and try to use them well. Apply good open licenses. Uh, think of all the elements such as hardware, software, documentation. Um, there are so many of them, but the way that you apply documentation to each may target specific freedoms, right? Um, to distribute, modify, study, and make. Um, and then there are different elements that make up for those freedoms and having the right um, formats, the right licenses, um, and having them coexist in a good way is really key to enabling all of this collaboration um, in creating impact. A good way to think about this um, is going to the Ultra certification page and reading about it. I think it's gonna be super useful for you to go and look at it, revisit it, um, try to look at the, the form for implementing uh, and for asking for a certification. So you can think about what things are missing. You can think of it as a some sort of a checklist of things that you have to finish. Um, and this is one of the functionalities that we're really interested in uh, on Appropedia, thinking about how to make it easy for the users to validate their documentation. Uh, by using the Oshawa certification process. And then use licenses that are compatible with each other. There are so many of them. I recommend that you think about the freedoms, what you want uh, to do with the hardware, uh, asking people what are their you know, favorite licenses, and then uh, you know, just having, having them you know, with a good license, Try not to leave things unlicensed because then people will not know, it's not expressed what your desires are with the documentation. And, you know, there are really good tools. I found this, for example, about different formats and then what you want, what are the freedoms that you want to enable. So, yeah, think about what is the end goal in mind that you have with this documentation think about your users, and then start thinking of a piece of documentation. Um, this is from the Ultra certification page. You can look at some of the recommended licenses for hardware, software, and documentation. Um, and then let's talk about platforms and portability. Some recommendations are choose accessible platforms for each of the audiences, as I mentioned before. Um, that they, maybe it's easy for them to log in, uh, it's in the right language, um, then use dedicated platforms for content types if you feel that it's important. For example, some people want to have um, 3D printing files on a platform that allows to look at the you know, volume uh, or isometric model and just turn it around and check it out or uh, check for the um, you know, the validity of it, etc. And <laughs> sorry, um, you can put all of them together, the, the different files, the different formats, and just um, link them to the main documentation page. If it is um, a GitHub page, for example, make sure that people are able to find the other files, right? And also think about mirrors uh, to your content because we don't know, maybe 20 years from now, different platforms will not be there or maybe the content will be moved. So it's um, a good idea to help others have access to mirror content, uh, maybe having like a zip file where um, people can download the whole thing, you know, um, without having a need for a specific platform, aim for longevity. Think about all of your solutions to be available 10 or 20 years down the road. Store files and platforms that are you know, 
uh, sorry, store file singing platforms that are most likely to last a long time. Uh, and also make sure that you don't get locked out of them. If you're saving things on platforms like uh, Google Drive or Dropbox or any of uh, uh, similar uh, solutions, think that if you lose access to your email uh, or if one of the team members uh, is not no longer available after a while, you might lose all the documentation. So it's important that all the files are mirrored in spaces and platforms that are open. Right? So not only open as in license, but also open access. And then make your documentation discoverable. Uh, metadata is a big part of it. Having good descriptions, motivations for the documentation, why you made this, uh, is good for having uh, your documentation appear on any um, search engine. And yeah, use... Uh, tools like the open know-how search tool, right? Uh, which takes many hundreds or thousands of um, documentation manifests and the metadata can be used to search, filter, etc. On Apropedia, for example, we use a lot of the sustainable development goals. So each of our solutions, uh, devices or projects are tagged by an SDG and you can search for a specific SDG that has a keyword or type of instance like a rocket stove, and then you can find all the rocket stoves that are trying to fulfill specific needs and maybe in different part of the world, etc. Um, so yeah, always think about discoverability. And then finally, work out loud. Um, when you're building this digital garden, just let other people know what you're doing. Uh, don't wait until the end, um, you know, Sharing how you make it will help you build a community. And you want to extend the impact of your work. You want your project to go beyond what you've done in a month or a year. You want this to last longer. You want other people to play with it and create uh, derivatives. So consider this. The sharing is not one-sided. So you want people to dialogue with you. You're the maker, but you want a community to let you know what they think. Um, if this really solved the problem. It's so nice when someone um, contacts you and say, you created this, this is so useful. This saved you know, my life. Um, it's so important that what you're making is going to solve a problem as we discussed at the beginning. It's all about critical making. There's a problem to be solved. You wanna know if the problem was solved. Um, as the outsiders who bring in solutions, we sometimes don't stay long enough because we have you know, life, we have other things, uh, but you still want to be able to know, right? So this is key. And then your documentation is a showcase, right, of your work. And it sells uh, the idea to contributors that can bring in uh, their time, their effort, their resources. So make sure that documentation really invites people. Uh, and then if your project's still incomplete or faulty, there's something that hasn't been done well. Um, if you're documenting it well, people can know about it and can help you solve it, right? So think of all the unsolved problems in your solution as good ideas that are still yet to be materialized. So uh, make sure that you show your documentation to others. Don't feel like you have to say, oh, you know, this is perfect. It'll be used in any situation. You can say, you know, we started, uh, we found that there's this fatal flaw in, on the design and someone will come up to you and say, I know, this is what you need to solve it, right? So uh, make sure to involve other people. Um, and this is part of the aspect of openness that's really nice, right? Um, the Memex method is really cool uh, because it helps you just do microblogging, put on Twitter. You can have, for example, a Twitter account of your project and share what you found, what has been done, have other people engage with it. Um, and then engage to the audience, uh, live publishing, issues, issues tracker on GitHub or GitLab, 
uh, comments and discussions on the documentation page. You have to be responsive. Let other people know that you're interested in their problems and their issues in reproducing. And then, you know, try to keep yourself involved with, um, with what you've created by looking at the imaginary internet points, right? How many people retweet, uh, share, bookmark your solution. And I think it's important to bring back what you've done. Um, this is one example of a live, uh, you know, a live um, workshop that we did with people in the community to map natural disasters. And we created something uh, which was a map using a card game. And then we gave it back to them and then we showed them the result, right? So one thing that we've learned over the years is that if there's information, if there's something that you're making using other people's input, you have to bring it back. Otherwise, you become an, ext an extractivist, right? You're just taking something from them and then leaving. So you have to bring it back. You have to discuss it, get people involved, get people excited, and you're going to learn as well, right? Participation, the main goal of participation is enabling influence from either side. So you have to let yourself be influenced by how people think about your project, about you, what you've made. And then finally, this is a photo um, of the work that we're doing with the UNDP uh, Accelerator Lab in El Salvador. And we're using Appropedia as, uh, as an appropriate technology tool to bring in information of all the studies that uh, they're doing. They're going to communities, gathering information about the devices that they're making, right? So this is the other way, uh, because they are sharing us how they make. And then we're taking all of this and we're putting it online and they're looking at their own documentation. So my invitation is that if you really like communicating, um, and maybe uh, you have someone on your team who's really good at doing that, uh, invite them to become the documentarians of the project, of other people's projects, right? We need good communication skills in making, and it's so good when someone who's really good at making things look at the, at the documentation of what they've done, and they see uh, their story being told, right? So it's important that we share how we make it, it's been so nice uh, to have this class and I'm looking forward to having some really nice discussion about sharing, about open licenses and documentation.